Welcome everybody to IS50B, week two of someday. So uh, last time I talked about story, right? And how you have to break down a story into emotional up and down beats. And uh, this uh, student here has submitted the story for Undertale, which is a game with horrifically bad graphics. Like it, it, it literally looks like something out of the early 80s, if you didn't know any better. And um, I, I kind of, I really, see that's not even the graphics. Like show me the graphic. yeah, like this, like it looks like that, you know? It just looks like, you know, DOS era, MS-DOS era graphics. And so, uh, do I hate on the pixel art? I'm not hating on it, it's just, I'm just saying, it just looks like, you know, like even most pixel art, they typically go for like NES era or SNES era. Um, but Undertale like went like IBM PC, you know, 286 era graphics. And so, um, and so the student here went um, and, and broke down the story using the Storybeats IO tool that I linked in the homework assignment which uh, is put on by the author Robin D. Laws I was talking about. He's one of my favorite authors. So if you go to Storybeats.io, it allows you to do like a little sketch of your plot. And so you can um, have emotional downbeats. And Undertale, Undertale starts with you encountering this very pretty little flower thing. And then it immediately goes, die, you know. And it sort of recurs... Um, it just looks like this cute little flower, right? And uh, he shares friendliness pellets, <laughs> which are actually bullets. Yeah. So uh, die, yeah. There you go. And. Uh, Um, so that would be a emotional downbeat, you know, I, I would even break it down prior to that because at first you're like, oh, cute little flower, emotional upbeat, and then it tries to murder you, the flower tries murdering you, which is a great opening to a video game, to be honest. Like, I don't, um, I don't like Undertale, especially, I find it to be kind of an, an annoying game, but um, that is a very memorable opening. And so, yeah, you get an emotional upbeat, then it immediately just yanks you down. Right, and then you're saved by this like cow demon kind of thing, and she takes you into her house, and you know you're an orphan, and she like takes care of you, and it's super nice and peaceful, and then um, the game ends if you don't leave, and so you have to leave, and she's like, no, it's not safe out there, you can't leave, and you have to fight her, and that's super jacked up, you know, and um, then you encounter a skeleton, and um, yeah, and so there's emotional upbeats, emotional downbeats, and uh, good games will sort of alternate them. And sometimes you have a really big upbeat and a small downbeat, and then a small upbeat and a big downbeat, and things like that. And so this is a great tool for thinking about story in, in sort of a, a structured fashion. And, and you want to, if you're going to be doing an RPG, you want to kind of space out these major events. You know, it's. Um, it's a tendency, it's a, there, there's a temptation to just be like, reveal everything to the player all at once. You know, what's going on here? And, and if you're talking to somebody who knows what's going on, well, they can just tell you everything. You know, by the way, you're the chosen one and you've got a parasite living inside of your brain that's going to kill you in seven days. And also, um, you know, you can talk to genies. And if you reveal all these things at once, it's called a, 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 an info dump. You know, and it just overwhelms the player. And so you usually want to space these things out. Like, hey, just by, by the way, you should know you have a parasite in your head. Uh, and the rest I can explain along the way. And then you, you get to a certain place and you discover a genie. And the guy's like, hey, by the way, you can talk to genies. What? Yeah. It was one of those things I was going to mention earlier. And so you sort of space out these these um, sort of uh, narrative informative things um, if you if you do a game right. Um, and, and like the feeling of acquiring power is also a big part of a role-playing game. Like, people like it when their characters feel more powerful over time in an RPG. You start off, you have a stick, and you hit things, and you're really terrible, and then, you know, you start building up, like, 
you know, combos and like feats or whatever. Yeah. So, so yeah, rather than info dumping, it's good to feed things to players over time. But at the same time, if you, if you trickle it out too slowly, like if you're with a companion that knows your entire backstory and your entire quest is like, find out what happened to your parents and they know, and you can't get it out of them. Like, it's just like frustrating, you know? So you, you have to be clever about how to do it. Like, Okay, yes, yeah, so let me tell you about your parents. An explosion happens. And, and if you make it too obvious, then players kind of get annoyed at you, you know. I will say, yeah, your parents loved you very much, uh, but they got called away to war. You know, you just tell them. It, but, like, you don't tell them they're part of a secret, you know, military experiment that teleports people into the future or the past, like Steins Gate or something like that, you know. So, um, you know, you could... You, you, you don't want to make it obvious that you're feeding them information slowly, but that is kind of part of good good design. And the, the feeling of ramping power up is also a good design in an RPG as well, where you discover, like, I have the ability to, to control ants with my mind, you know, or something, you know. Um, later on, you find the person guiding you is the one killing your people. Yeah, that's true, too. That's a, a fairly common trope, you know, that... Um, you know, the inevitable betrayal of the shady person. Yeah. Um, I think a little poly can look more creepy and scary. Uh, yeah, the, um, especially in Undertale, like all the, all the um, graphics are like really kind of creepy and disturbing looking, right? Uh, like, it's not, Like, there, there's something very uh, um, weird, sort of the uncanny valley. Did we talk about that in 58? The uncanny valley. Um, which is when you have things that look human, kind of, but like there's something off about them, then uh, the human brain sort of reacts very uh, negatively to it. You know, like they're trying to make something look realistically human. And then we're like, ah, ah, ah you know, so. <laughs> yeah, so the, the premise is that uh, cute things are very not very realistic looking, right? And so uh, you can make things look more realistic and that's kind of cool. Um, but then there's like this area where like, you know, there's something off and, uh, and here we go, uh, that's rough, you know? And so a lot of animations have to deal with the uncanny valley. Something like that, a mannequin isn't going to bug you because they're obviously unrealistic, you know? But, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Jeez. One way to get around the Uncanny Valley, change proportions. Yeah. Yeah. That doesn't trigger us the same way. Yeah. Picano Humanist Score. Yeah. Like, yeah, so there's an area where we're just like, eh, it's not cool. Okay, so. Let's take a look at some of the other story wards. Uh, oh, Yui's back. Cool, cool, cool. Um, sitting in a wagon with other handcuffed people. All right. Yeah, I know. I know where this one's going. Hey, you. <laughs> other people in the wagon all say you're getting executed. Yeah, that's definitely downbeat. Rip the execution spot. Do with big axe. The scene there. One of the people gets executed. Tries to win. Tries to run. Gets shot by an archer. Yep. Uh, character creation, yeah, that's neutral. Kind of fun, maybe a little bit. I don't know. It's not really an upbeat. Um, guys asking, we're not on the list. Maybe we get to live. Yeah, that's like, oh, hey, he's not supposed to be here. And then the guard's like, nope, kill him anyway. He... <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, the dragon screech. Yeah, that's a beacon of hope. Uh, they chop somebody's head off. Uh, the dragon appears. Um, dragon starts burning everything, which I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. Because it's good that it's freeing you from being executed. It's bad because you're now dealing with uh, Helgen on fire, right? So, um, 
um, yeah, and so, and that's just one, you know, scene in, you know, a fairly famous RPG, right? So, let's look at Aaron's. A lot of neutral, a lot of neutral. Yeah. Um, usually when you find a clue, like that's usually like an emotional upbeat also. We discovered something, you know, it was aliens, you know, that's usually over KFC. Uh, spotted the last minute. Yeah, usually if you get spotted, that's a downbeat. Go get him. I don't know. Uh, yeah, you got a lot of neutral ones here. Um, so pawns and stealth. So fights and pawns. Um, lost is usually a downbeat too. When you're lost in the woods, that's a downbeat. Um, after you win, that's an upbeat usually. Uh, yeah, I, I'd probably revise that a little bit. Um, and then Ben Court, we need a. Yeah, you got, you got the essay, but we need a, we need the uh, storybeats.io dot io thing. Cause it, it's it's a nice way of breaking down a story because it, it lets you see if you're if you're being too negative or too positive. Um, a book that I'm reading right now, which is called Project Hail Mary or something like that. Um, neutral it tur turns out to be kind of boring. It, it can be melancholy. Melancholy is usually kind of a negative feeling too. Uh, like if you're exploring an abandoned town where you grew up, you know, and you discover like a calendar from 1998, you know, and it has your third birthday circled on it or something like that's an emotional kind of downbeat. I, maybe it's neutral, but it's kind of depressing, you know, and so a uh, missed melancholy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, in, in Mist, the um, the emotions are conveyed partly through music. The, um, the exploration's all sort of like, yeah, I would say melancholy is a good word for it. But also, you open up books and they play like quick time videos of of like people trapped in the books and yeah. You know. Um, where's I gonna go with that? Yeah, so, yeah, you want to have emotional highs and lows. Oh, yeah, Project Hail Mary, right? And so, it's by the guy who did The Martian. It's his latest book, came out earlier in the year. And I'm almost done with it. And it's it's I, I've really enjoyed it. I would give it a solid, like, 9 out of 10. The only criticism I have for it is that not enough bad things happen to the character. <laughs> Which sounds weird. It sounds really weird because the main character uh, wakes up on a spaceship, you know, 12 light years from Earth. No idea how he got there. Has to save humanity. You know, his friends are all dead. Um, it's, you know, it starts with like a really, really big emotional downbeat, but the dude doesn't have his memory. And so it sort of mutes the, the impact of everything. It's like he knew these people were his friends, but he doesn't remember them. So, you know, it's sort of... You know, you, you have this feeling of like intensity, of like, all right, you're well, welcome to this new solar system on, you know, 12 light years away. Uh, you got to find something here to save humanity back home. Um, you know, it's got intensity, but like, as he does his science, because it's Andy Weir, he's the guy that did The Martian, right? And uh, what was the other one? Artemis. Uh, he's, he, you know, he's like a, a NASA nerd, you know, and so all the science is spot on. There's no warp technology. There's no, um, you know, all, all the physics is basically pretty accurate. Uh, the, the premise is that there's space algae that's like eating the light of the sun. And there's this one solar system over there that isn't, the light of the sun isn't decreasing. They know they have the, the algae, the space algae, but their sun is not decreasing in light intensity. And so they, they build a spaceship and travel over there to try and figure out what the heck is going on and why the space algae isn't dying. And the, the one bit of like sci-fi unobtainium, you know, nonsense is the space algae, right? But that's the premise of the story. 
So it actually works because the premise of the story is that there's algae that is an extremophile algae that can exist in outer space and it, it can absorb sunlight and at thousands of degrees, it just absorbs it and converts it into mass. And so that's the premise. So with that premise, they build a spaceship using the algae as fuel because it has billions of joules of energy in it. So they actually can do a constant thrust drive, which, um, you know, if you do the math on a constant thrust drive, if you've ever seen the expanse or something like that, um, the math actually checks out. You can actually travel like to Jupiter in like a couple weeks, um, which normally takes us, you know, years to get to Jupiter. Cause what we do is we normally launch a rocket at high speed and then just flies at high speed towards Jupiter. But if you have a constant thrust drive, you can accelerate it one, one G, like just normal Earth gravity, as long as you're constantly accelerating, um, and then you flip over halfway uh, to your destination and constantly accelerate down, you can actually travel through the solar system in a reasonable amount of time. And uh, they traveled at 1.5 Gs from Earth to a Tau Ceti uh, 12 light years away, and it took about three years of subjective time to do it. And, you know, it, it constant thrust drives actually, like if you do the math on them, they're, they're pretty amazing. So anyway, so my, my, that's the premise of the book is that there's space algae, earth's going to die because the sunlight is actually decreasing. And if you decrease the solar output of the sun, then the earth cools down and people die. So everything seems like stacked against them, right? But here's the trouble. There's not enough an emotional downbeats in the book. Like, as he's going along, he just gets everything right. And good thing after good thing after good thing happened to him. And eventually, you know, like, something goes wrong and the ship springs a leak or whatever, you know. Uh, but that's, like, that's like almost at the end of the book before anything goes wrong. Um, there, uh, several things actually happen wrong all at the same time, you know, towards the end of the book. But for, like, two-thirds of the book, he's just, like, doing science and he's, make, he's making discoveries and... Um, everything's going well. And, and to me, like when I was reading, I'm like, there needs to be an emotional downbeat here somewhere, you know, there, there needs, he needs to have a challenge to overcome because so far there's like no challenges. He's doing science and he's getting results and he's coming up with a cure. And so, um, so yeah. And so I feel like it's, it's not quite as good as the Martian, but it's a pretty darn good book. So, um, the point being, if you sketch out your book in terms of story beats, like what kinds of things are happening, is it a dramatic, is it a procedural, and the emotional ups and downs, then you can kind of look at it and be like, all right, I probably shouldn't, like if I was this editor, I probably would have inserted like one thing going wrong, you know, like he can't find food or something. He knows there's food on the spaceship, but he starts starving to death because um, he lost his memory. And he knows somewhere within here there's food, uh, but I don't know where it is, you know? And so, I don't know, some sort of, you know, some sort of, like, emergency. Because, you know, if you're st stuck without your memory 12 light years away, like, at some, you're, you're going to screw something up because you don't remember how to operate the ship that you're supposed to know how to operate. You know what I mean? So that's, that's my one criticism. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk, we're going to talk map design today and we're going to talk first person shooters because that's what I know best. And your, your assignment for Tuesday is to sketch out, uh, you don't even have to do it in Unreal Engine, just sketch out in pen and paper, kind of like what I'm about to do right here, 10, 14, 21, a, a two team, Uh, your assignment for Tuesday, sketch out a two team capture the flag style map. Um, something like that. It's a good size. Have any of you guys not played first person shooters before? MS Paint's fine. Is that too low quality? There, for this class, there's no such thing as too low quality, Mr. Yui. We are very much a <laughs> not, not demand. I use, I use rainbow ink for my students. <laughs> okay. 
Um, so, uh, have you guys all played games like Halo, Team Fortress, Team Fortress 2? Um, there are some other good examples. Warframe. And, uh, you, you guys all know what I'm talking about? Can you give me a thumbs up in chat? Like, If you don't understand the genre, like none of this is going to make sense. So, let's talk about uh, Bencourt. Aaron, have you guys played Capture the Flag? Okay. So the, the general notion is you've got like a base over here and a base over here. And this applies in like real life Capture the Flag too, which I used to play as a kid, which is really fun. You got a, that, you got like a neutral zone. And you like sneak into the enemy base and in real life you tag somebody that's in your base and they go to, they go to a jail area. In a video game, you kill them, and then they respawn at some point, come back. Okay, so uh, this applies to Halo. Halo, this might be like, you know, like a kilometer of empty zone, right? You have to get a warthog and run across or, you know, walk slowly around the world. Um, or it could be Team Fortress where there's just like, um, you know, there's just a bridge connecting the two. Okay, so... Let's go over let's go over good map design for this genre, and then you get to sketch out one of your. Own. So you have to think about the flow, and so inside of your base, you might have different spawn points. So you might have, I'll do it in white. Uh, you might have a spawn point up here, somewhere in your base, and I haven't laid out any of the inside of the base. You might have a spawn point over here, and a spawn point down here, right? Because if everybody spawns in one place, you can spawn camp them, right? So if everybody comes out of a doorway, then you just sit there and you just shoot that door, and then your team runs the flag and runs the flag back. And uh, every time the enemy respawns, they come out of the door, and your whole team just sits there with, you know, bazooka, just blowing them away every time somebody comes out of the door. So one spawn location is uh, rough. It's very rough. You want to spawn people in different areas in your base. Okay, so let's think about the flow. Like, let's say we want to go from our base into the enemy base and then and then back. You're going to need to have some sort of capture point. So you're going to have to have some sort of capture point where you can bring the enemy flag back to. And so what's going to happen is that there's usually going to be some sort of, like, middle ground, like the neutral zone. And this is going to be kind of like one long choke point, kind of. So you're going to have, because just people are going to be, what the, what the flow of this map is going to be is that people are going to spawn out of their base and they're going to go into the neutral zone. Okay. And then people on the enemy team, they're going to be spawning in the same places on their side. And they're going to be, let's use a blue one for, for them. And so they're going to be going into the neutral zone. And if the teams are balanced, then what happens is that this area in the middle here just turns into one giant combat zone and nothing happens. Like people just keep respawning and then people shoot each other and then they, you know, die and then they respawn and they come back. And in this area is where most of the action will take place. And you have to think of this again in terms of flow. It's like fluid dynamics, like water flowing through a system. What direction do players walk in? And then if a player gets a breakthrough, then what's going to happen, like if one team defeats the other, then they're going to walk into the enemy base, they're going to go through the, the world inside of the base, grab the flag, and then they have to walk it back out. And then they're back in the neutral zone again, and they're probably going to die, because the whole enemy team is going to be hunting after the person with the flag. And then the team will attack over and over again, and hopefully get the flag, and bring it back, and bring it back over time, and capture the, at the capture point. If the teams are really lopsided, then blue will just die and red will just run the flag over and over again and win. But if the teams are relatively balanced, you can think of it, it's, it's like in a MOBA, right? If you've played um, League of Legends or Defense of the Ancients, you've got a base and the base has three lanes, right? And, it, and it's literally a flow. Like it actually flows like little army units at each other. And what your goal is in a MOBA is to make your team, make your team's army push the other team's army back, back, back. And you push them all the way back and then you destroy their, their base. That's the goal of a MOBA. 
it, it, it's literally a flow. It's literally, um, it spawns army units that um, push against the other army units. And by default, they just bounce. They just, they come to the middle and they just fight each other like this. And they just bounce. But the players come in and they kill the enemy units. And then the good units will start pushing in. And then uh, there's a little tower along the way. There's like a tower here and a tower here. You know. And the goal is to sort of take down these uh, these towers. And take out the enemy army. And then you push your flu into their base. And League of Legends... Um, uh, control maps are different, right? But you, you can you can you literally see the flow on these maps, right? Like, the, the it's an actual trail of army units moving towards the end, and their their trails come at you, and then they push. They normally push; they just don't do anything. They wipe each other out. But as a player, you can adjust the odds into your favor and have your army do better. So with a first-person shooter, um, it's a little more hidden, but there's still flows in the map. And so whenever you have a common area between two, two sides, this is going to be the primary battlefield, okay? And so you want to usually try to make this interesting, right? Make it maybe add some mountains or uh, a lake or some terrain to hide behind. Um, you can put a sniper tower like over here somewhere and the snipers can be like shooting at people down there and Team Blue can have their sniper tower and maybe shooting at people over there as well. And then maybe the snipers start shooting at each other or maybe block them off so they can't see each other. And just snipers are seeing they're picking on people in the in the common zone. So the this map design is kind of the basis, but what you want to do is make it more interesting. You you want if, if the entire game is just a, essentially a long corridor, that is very boring map design. And that's not just for first-person shooters, it's for all games. If if you look at the map design of, like, Final Fantasy thirteen or whatever it was, this is what the maps looked like. This is, like, Final Fantasy thirteen, Right? Wasn't that the one with, like, snow? Yeah, that's the one. Lightning. Final Fantasy XIII map design. Not very helpful. This, this is Final Fantasy II, which is more complicated than Final Fantasy XIII. Right? It is. It is. It's really depressing. Um... Final Fantasy. Why is it giving me older? Yeah, yeah this, this is basically what the maps would look like in Final Fantasy 13. <laughs> you walk down a quarter. You walk down a quarter. You walk down a quarter. You walk down more of a quarter. And then you walk down a quarter. And then you walk down a quarter. And then you walk down another quarter. And you just keep walking. And, 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 and then walking some more. And then you get to here. And you walk down to here. Doo, 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 doo. And then you're in another quarter. And then you walk to this quarter. And then you walk to this one. And then you walk to here. You know, it's it's just a single path that you, like, you literally just walk down a path. And every once in a while, there'll be, like, a little uh, supply closet or something. And you stick your nose in there. And you're like, oh, there's a treasure chest. Look at me. I'm rewarded 2,000 Jill for sticking my head into the uh, side closet there. You know, or they're you know a little ten foot wall. Oh, there's a you know, treasure chest. You walk over there, you pick it up. It it has hands down the most boring. Look at this. Like the whole thing is just like a quarter. It's just a quarter. You just walk. It's just literally just a linear. You just walk. You just walk. You just walk. <laughs> it's from start to finish. You just walk down the quarter, and every so often there's a little there's a little ten foot long side panel side side quarter, and you go over there and you pick up your incentive chip or whatever you know is the most garbage game design i've ever seen as far as map design goes and they do this for a reason like they don't do this for just like you know making a bad game they do this because um they're horrified that players will get lost okay 
like when they're play testing, if they discover that uh, players don't know where to go and they start running in circles and get lost, then they stop playing. I stopped playing Final Fantasy XIII, though, because the maps looked like this. Yeah. So, um, two forts in TF2, best, worst capture map. Yeah, so, yeah, let's talk about two forts. So let's, let's go through that. Um, two forts is a classic design. It's not the best, but it's a classic design. So you've got a fortress, common area, fortress. And then uh, there is a ground floor entrance, and then there's a balcony. Let's see if I can make this 3D a little bit. And um, you can, you've got like a little courtyard in front. There's a bridge, and then there's the enemy base over here. Okay. And the enemy base, likewise, has a doorway. Actually, there's two doorways, but whatever. Okay. So the point is, is that you spawn. You like let's. Just follow the path of Team Blue over here. Team Blue is going to spawn. They jump. They run through the courtyard. They go into the entrance. Now what? Now what? You walk into the entrance. There's two options. It, and the reason why it's important for there always to be two entrances is because if there's only one entrance, then people can choke point it. People can sit there and point all their guns right at the spot and kill people as they come in. Anytime there's a choke point, it benefits the defense. Anytime there's multiple routes to the flag, it benefits the offense. And so the compromise a lot of these games take is they do something like this, where you come in and there's a spiral staircase over here that doesn't matter right now. But when you come in, you can either head immediately to the right or you can ha head around this way and go into a quarter. There's a water area over here. And so since this is a choke point, they give you an alternate way of bypassing this choke point by jumping into the water. You swim underneath and you come up the spiral staircase here. So if the, if, the cho if this common area gets too annoying, you just jump into the water, swim underneath, and then come out that way as an alternative to the choke point. Because whenever there's a choke point, it gets really lame if the defense can hold it permanently and the offense can't ever get through. So when you come through one of these two ways, there is another choke point. And this is called the lobby or the uh, ramp room, technically is what it's called. And... Um, and in the ramp room, there is a choke point. And that choke point is actually right here. Because there is one ramp leading up to the second story this way. And there's one ramp leading up to the second story this way. And so this spot right here where the two ramps come together is a choke point. All people on offense must go through that spot. So it's very common to fortify that with pipe bombs. And they move the ramps back a little bit so it's not a choke point quite so much. But either way, all the offense basically passes through the ramp room here. One way or the other there is an exit this way out of it and that takes you down to the basement level uh, the other way is you come up this way and it takes you to a staircase going down to the basement level then the basement level is over here the flag is back here and uh, basically um, not trying it's quite right but basically if you come down the uh, the elevator here uh, you come in kind of this way and if you come down the spiral stairs, you kind of come in this way. And then there's two ramp, there's two ways to get to the to the flag. So at every point, there's and, and there's kind of a common area right here that kind of everybody has to pass through, so you can kind of fortify that area as well. But it's not like a door. Like there's always alternate ways to get to the flag. So if they super fortify and block off one approach, you can come around and, and take the other approach. But coming out, you can't go up the elevator. This this way is one way. And so coming out, you have to go up the staircase here. So every time you hear that your flag's been captured, the defense will immediately run and fortify this zone. It is a narrow corridor that makes a series of 90 degree turns coming up. And um, if you're a scout or something, and you're trying to run the flag out up the staircase, a heavy weapons guy can just stand there and spray bullets down the, the corridor and you can't get past. It is, this is the primary choke point for defense, is the flag runners can get in, and, and that's kind of more exciting. It's kind of more exciting for people to be able to get in and touch the flag, and everybody here is, flag has been touched, you know. Um, go defend the flag if you're on defense. But then when they try to run out, the defense will move to just choke point the hell out of the spiral staircase. And scouts and things like that, they're really fast and can run the, and move the flag really fast fast have a really hard time dealing with this 
because people can just sit there and spam. They can throw grenades, pipe bombs, heavy weapons guy, pretty much any class. Uh, maybe not a sniper, but like a pyro can sit there and just spray fire down the corridor. And a poor little scout can't do anything about it. So the scouts have to rely on their teammates to come in and clear clear this for them. So you have to move it as a team. And so the scout might have a soldier or something partnered with them, and the soldier can clear the ramp for them. Then the scout will bust out, come up the thing, jump off the battlements, run across the, the, the world at high speed, come in here, go up the ramp room, and then go to the capture point right here. And so the that's the flow of a capture. You spawn, you go across the common area, you have to work your way through a series of kind of like two-way choke points, right? There's one way this way, one way this way, the ramp room has one way this way, one way this way. Uh, going to the flag room, there's one way this way, one way this way. But then coming out, you kind of have to go up the ramp room, or uh, up the uh, spiral staircase. And so that's that's where the defense is sort of centered. And so it's, it's a pretty good pretty good design overall. Um, it's not the best. It's not the most subtle. Every doorway has an alternative to it. So if they're really hard defending one door, you get on the other door. If they're, if they're hardcore defending the ramps, you take the elevator down. Uh, and then you can come up when they're not expecting it. you know, Because they might be, like maybe the flag was dropped here, right? And so now they're going to be looking out to see if somebody's going to be coming down the, the, the staircase to get the flag. If you jump down the back way and come up from behind them, you can oftentimes backstab and kill them and make your way out um, with the flag. So, uh, sentry nest, yeah. So, uh, there is a sentry nest up here and the uh, the uh, sniper nest, I mean. Sniper nest up here. And these guys pick at people as they come through the center area. Um, and you can build, yeah, you can build sentry guns in here to defend it. Um, yeah, they're, typically sentry guns are built to hold choke points, right? And so everybody's got to touch the flag, so you put a sentry gun on the flag. Everybody's got to go through this area, you put a sentry gun on that area. You know? Um, and so anytime that the entire offense has to go through a zone, you, you can drop a sentry on it and cover it. And it provides backup. If you leave it by itself, it'll get destroyed, but if you have it there with teammates that are protecting it, it's really hard for the enemy to get through because the sentry gun will just blow you away. The, the, the enemy wants to be able to have a sentry gun and nothing else so they can kind of pick at it with rockets and kind of take it down. But if there's people attacking you, you don't have the time to kind of pick down the, the sentry gun. And so that's, you know, part of an essential breakfast for defense. Okay, um, let's look at the flow of another map. This one I'll make even bigger so I don't make it quite so obnoxious looking. And so this one is called The Well which um, has a really great map flow to it. So again, it's a two-team two capture the flag, and this is your assignment. It's due on Tuesday. I want you to design a map. Um, because level design is an important part of this class. And level design for two-person capture the flag, I know very, very well. So the design for the well is that you've got a... You've got two spawn zones. Spawn zone spawn zone and then there's sort of an attic area up here where it, there's another spawn zone then these things feed into a corridor that goes to the main entrance main entrance quite obviously a choke point defenses will hold them you know if they can uh, spawn point big courtyard area also a place where defense can hold, and then there's a doorway leading out, leading out of the, the thing, and then there's a stairway that leads up that goes into the upstairs. There's two stairways, in fact, that go up. So from the courtyard area here, there's actually a stair up, a stair up, and a um, doorway back. The doorway splits, of course it splits, and then there's two doors leading into the flag area. So the flag area is kind of back here. There's a bridge, there's kind of an open area, and there is a tower. And to get up the tower, there is elevators that kind of go up and down. And you have to ride the elevator up, and then up at the very top of the tower up here, there's the flag. And so I'm kind of switching to orthogonal mode, but there's a upstairs area that you can you can go to go to the upstairs area over here, or you can jump down and run out this way. 
so there's one, two, three ways out of the flag area. Uh, this is water down here. That's water down there. And there's an underwater exit that leads out like this. And so here's the, here's the front gate here. And then there's a uh, fighting area up there. And then the water actually continues up this way, over like this, down like this, over like this, and up like this. Uh, through the entire map. So it so if you wanted, you could go from your base because it actually it actually connects all the way up into into here. There's actually a water source here. And so when you spawn, you can jump in here and feasibly swim here, 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 all without drawing any attention of the enemy snipers, right? And actually pop all the way back into their into their uh, flag room. You know, there's, and then they have a tower over here somewhere with a, with a flag on it. So you can actually feasibly swim the entire thing, but this is all open area. And um, so in the open area in the world, there is um, a shed that divides the world in two. And, uh, and so basically there's a bridge, and then over here there's a bridge, and then there's the enemy base, which is the same on the other side. And... Um, and so the flow is this. So basically they are going to go, if you're on team blue, this is team red over here. They're going to leave, they're going to leave their base. They're going to cross the, they're going to cross the river on the bridge. They're going to go into the shed. The shed has different openings. One, two, three, four. And then there's like a wall that runs down the middle. And so there's snipers over here and the snipers are going to be picking at people the whole time. And so you can hide in the shed and then there's little windows you can shoot back at the snipers from there. And then you can make your way through the shed, out, run across the open area, and then go in through the front door through the first choke point. Or you can jump in the water and swim underneath and come up over this way right into the flag zone. There's a choke point, there's a way around the choke point. Okay, that's, that's what I wanna see from your, from your map designs. If every choke point should have an alternative way around it, or worst case, um, you know, have a choke point only when you're leaving with the flag, not when you're coming in. Okay, because it's a very frustrating game if you never touch the flag the entire game, and that's quite possible because you you respawn back in your base, whereas these people have to walk across the world, you know, and then you die, and then you have to walk across the world again. Whereas the defenders, if they die, they respawn here and they just come right back. And so it's hard, it's, there's, an, there's an inherent problem for offense, which is that the defenders get a respawn quicker. They get, a back, get back in position quicker. So killing them accomplishes almost nothing. So there's almost no point fighting. You know, like you'll fight them, but like there's no point because they just immediately respawn. So what you're really trying to do is just like throw grenades at them and get them to like kind of dip back into their base and hide. And then you run down this way and go through here, go through here, go through here, make it across the bridge, take the elevator up to the top, grab the flag, jump down, and then you can either run back out that whole way with the whole team chasing you, but probably at this point you'll jump into the water at that point and swim out here, pop out, and then make it back to your base and capture it. Okay. And so what you have with the flow of the space is that you've got people constantly coming out. Uh, I'll switch to red for Team Red. You're gonna have people constantly popping out. Is it doing it again? Is it doing it again? Relaunch. Yeah, good map design makes or breaks the game. I quit playing Final Fantasy 13 because the map design was so bad. It was just such garbage, absolute garbage game design, a level design that I didn't even care about the rest of the game. I got so bored so fast. Okay, so the map flow for red is going to look like this. They're going to keep coming out of their their um, spawn zones into this courtyard. And then if they're on defense, they might move here to protect the front door. Or if they're on defense, they can come back into here and like protect the flag. And if they're on offense, they come out this way and they go into the common area. The neutral zone. 
and these people are going to be flowing this way, and the offense is going to be flowing this way, and they're going to start shooting each other. And then the snipers will sit there and pick off people, and, and they'll push back and forth. But the goal being is that a certain percentage of them will make it to the front door of the enemy base. And then they have to fight through this choke point, make their way to the courtyard, fight their way through this choke point, make their way into the flag zone, make their way across the bridge, make their way up a elevator. And when you're on an elevator, you're very vulnerable because you're not moving. You're just riding an elevator up and anyone could shoot you. Make it up, grab the flag, jump down, and then run all the way back out. And while they're running back out and trying to go through these tunnels and things like that, all the rest of the enemy team is hunting after you. All the people on offense are there too, and it's very difficult. So it's a very exciting thing to have the flag and be sprinting back to your to your base and your teammates are trying to cover you and the entire enemy team is chasing after you. It's exciting game design. And uh, what makes it more fun is that at any point you just like jump into the water and then swim around this way. And now of course they're all going to try and meet you over here in the shed where the water comes up. Actually it doesn't connect this way. It connects. There's actually two different modes. You have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I have this back. It's like this, but flipped. So you can swim to here, and then you have to walk through the corridor to here, and then it's the the thing mirrored the other way. So so you can you can go across the entire map not getting shot by snipers if you take the slow water out. So yeah, if you pop out here, then the enemy are probably going to be waiting for you. But um, you know you, you can avoid sniper fire and stuff like that. So your assignment is just take MS Paint, one note, whatever, and I want you to sketch out. A two-team capture the flag uh, map that does not have solitary choke points on them. In other words, every choke point that exists on the map must have an alternative way into the flag. Doesn't necessarily have to be there for the way out, just on the way in. Every door has to have an alternative. Okay, and try and make it try and make it look cool. All right. That's your class for today. Any questions? Map design is fun. You get a job doing map design. Okay. I've had friends that have done map design professionally. Yeah. And this is the kind of thing you think about. You think about the flow. How do people move through the map? How do the armies clash? Where do they clash? Are they clashing in a place where it's interesting? You know, if you're if you're putting 32 people into a corridor that's five feet wide, they're going to get stuck on top of each other. Yeah. So you have to have big open spaces when big armies are going to be colliding with each other. All right. Yeah. Good luck. That's it for today. See you guys on Tuesday. Oh, uh, and I'm giving a talk on the SCA tomorrow at four o'clock here on Discord. Right. I'll see you.